so let me introduce our first speaker who is Sim van der Plu. Sim van der Plu is the Special Projects Advisor at Wild Animal Initiative and also offers coaching and consulting the, uh, to new effective animal advocacy groups. So right now I pass the microphone to you, Sim. Thank you, Bianca, and thank you for uh, carefully pronouncing my name. I appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, Monica, too, also thanks for hosting this. I'm sure you're very tired on this last day, but from my perspective, at least, everything has gone very uh, well these last two days. Uh, yeah, so I will switch now to sharing my screen. Hopefully, I can make that work. Uh, Let's see if you cannot see this. Can you signal? Okay, great. So yeah, I think you don't have to be a manager to lead. And um, I will try to explain to you why today. So hello, everyone. Nice to see a whole bunch of familiar faces here. I appreciate that you're using your Sunday afternoon for some people Sunday very early morning. Um, to be here to learn how you can better protect animals. I just finished a sci-fi novel about anarchy. I am a product of colonialism. I don't depend on my work for money and I have such issues with authority that I won't even follow recipe instructions. That is not my usual introduction to who Steen van der Ploeg is, but I think it's helpful for you to know where I'm coming from so you feel encouraged to listen to me with an open mind to why I think you can and should lead even if you're not a manager. I hope you will, you will be skeptical, not just of me, but of all leadership strategies you learn about. There are millions of books and classes and podcasts about leadership, but the hard data available is pretty limited. And on top of that, your personal experience, your cause, the structure of your organization, all influence what type of leadership works best in your situation and industry. To tell you a little bit more about my professional situation, I have worked at various nonprofits over 15 years in fundraising, um, administration, operations, and I just started to work for Wild Animal Initiative. At Wild Animal Initiative, my super smart and compassionate colleagues at this research institute work to understand and improve the lives of free-ranging sentient animals. Besides that work, I offer project-based support to new effective animal advocacy organizations, as Bianca said earlier. I am lucky enough to do all my work for free without taking salary. So the ideas I will share with you today have largely been stolen from these books and a bunch of others and from articles and podcasts, but also from various courses and classes. Some directly about people management, others about critical thinking, effective altruism, uh, diversity and inclusion, or negotiation. But most importantly, um, I have learned from doing, and I have learned from these people. These are some of my colleagues at the various charities I've worked for. Um, and you can maybe pick me out in all of these pictures, but that might be a little bit difficult with how small the faces are. But um, yeah, I've learned more from these people than I have from uh, reading and training or from reading and training combined. I've learned from making mistakes, from people's feedback and through osmosis, being around people who lead and experiencing what works and um, what doesn't and from talking and listening to these people. In the center, you also see me with my partner that was, I'm pretty sure, on my 40th birthday. He is a senior director at a software company, and I learn daily from his ideas, uh, from his successes and his challenges, and he also gives me insight into how things are done in the corporate world, which I haven't had that much exposure to. So now you know how I learned the things I'll share, but what is it exactly that I hope you'll learn? Well, I um, will not blow your mind with novel ideas. I will share what I think 
are um, some common sense recommendations that you can try to turn into common practice. To me, leadership is about the impact you can have on others, irrespective of your authority. In this talk, I'll go over four ways to influence others so you can do more good together. I will explain why I think you should question ideas, plans, assumptions, and the behavior of your coworkers, including your managers. Inspire your colleagues and show them the difference they make. Support your coworkers' development and connect with your team so people feel like they belong. These four pillars will strengthen your leadership. I hate the word strengthen, I cannot pronounce it. Uh, afterwards, I'd like to uh, ask you what you think and hear about your experiences. And all the way at the end, we should have time to go over your questions in Slido. So why do I think you should lead? Well, this whole presentation rests on four assumptions I have about you. I think you want to help more animals. You know some interventions and work methods are more effective than others. You want to feel valued, like you make a difference and like you belong. You want your coworkers to feel the same. So based on these assumptions, I believe it is your responsibility to try to lead your team and organization in the direction that helps the most animals. And those animals include your coworkers. It is not just your moral duty, I think, to stand up for what is right. We must try to do the most good we can. When you lead, you will prevent burnout. Faunalytics found people leave or animal organizations due to leadership and burnout. Your leadership can improve team spirit, create a trusting, open and safe environment, contribute to a known blame culture, and show the difference your collective work is making. This will make it less likely that, your, that you or the people on your team will suffer from mental and physical stress and exhaustion. You will help more animals. As you might have heard Jamie say yesterday, animal advocacy careers found CEOs and hiring professionals in effective animal advocacy organizations identified leadership as one of the most urgent skill gaps in our movement. So your leadership will make the movement more effective. You can help fill those gaps. Practicing leadership will also lead to personal growth. You gain more confidence, you feel more in control, and you strengthen not just your professional, but also your personal relationships. But leading when you're not in management is not always easy. Some people might not appreciate what you do. Hierarchical organizations and managers stuck to their ways might label you difficult. But you will have to stand up for what is right. You must take responsibility for how you and your colleagues are treated. And you can make a difference. You can save more animals and you can probably experience more joy in your work than you think you can. So to get to the first um, point, question ideas, plans, assumptions, and behavior. It is normal in each of our countries to use animals as products, to see them as things, to kill and eat them. You grew up and still live in a culture where few people questioned those norms, but you did. It didn't matter that most people followed to the customs of animal abuse. You felt it was wrong, did research, and are working to change the status quo. You can use that same curiosity, humility, and compass of your, moral compass of yours to make your organization more effective. Like maybe you don't like the performance reviews, or how meetings are run, or maybe you wonder why some specific tasks are important for animals to lead better lives. Is there evidence for that? Did someone test if this works best? The managers and executives in your organization might also not have the full picture or fully grasp what the day-to-day -day work on the ground is like. Your perspective is helpful in finding the best option. Because of your position, you might also be better at taking the lead on certain issues. As someone without hierarchical authority, you are not likely to be blinded by the power you have. Multiple studies have shown that power and privilege influence one's ability to make evidence-based decisions with an open mind. 
wisdom, according to Plato and a bunch of other people since then, is knowing what you know and knowing what you don't know. It can be harder for the people in charge to know what they don't know. You, on the other hand, might be better able to think critically how an operation system or a corporate campaign could work. And you must share that perspective. So ask why repeatedly. What's the purpose of what you're doing? Knowing why something is important for the mission to succeed and how it works will make it easier for you to do it. You asking questions will also make it easier for others to speak up. Why does this meeting lead to save more animals? Why does this cage-free strategy lead to less suffering? Why are these people on your governing board? When you dig into these whys, you clarify the work for others. Then be nosy and noisy or be curious and difficult. If you are the smart and silent type who fixes mistakes without confronting the error makers, you actually are undermining organizational learning. If you think something could possibly be done better, but you don't speak up, you might save fewer animals. So please be nosy and noisy. And don't forget to question your own ideas and actions either. Is what you're doing really the best way to get results? How do you know? Maybe ask the opinion of someone who's willing to disagree with you. Then inspire. How, show people how the difference, uh, what the difference is that we can make together. Phonalytics, again, great organization. They found that dissatisfaction with a type of advocacy and not feeling like you make a difference are big reasons that people leave uh, animal advocacy movement. You can reconnect people to their motivation. You can help them see the impact they have. By inspiring people, you light them into action. So together, we can do it. Billions of farmed animals will continue to be murdered every year. We still know very little about the experiences of animals in the wild, let alone about how to sustainably reduce their suffering. Those facts are bleak. But I'm absolutely confident that we are building the roads towards the future in which humanity cares for animals. The actions we take today can spare a vast number of animals a lifetime of suffering just years from now. So many fishes, chickens, tadpoles, pigs, I cannot even imagine, they'll have better lives. It is difficult and much stands in our way, but together we can build not just roads, but rockets to a better future. I hope you remember this and remind each other when things get hard that our work makes a difference for real individuals. Make the invisible clear. Spreadsheets make animals happier. Sometimes we need to do things that seem far removed from protecting animals. Filling out spreadsheets, raising money, creating budgets, administration. We're not all rescuing foxes from fur farms. Remind yourself and others how mundane tasks relate to a better world. When I compare um, last year's average donations to this year's, that means I will have more information to raise more money next time. And with more money at Wild Animal Initiative, you can hire more researchers and learn more about how we can give animals the lives they prefer. Be impatient for a better future. We can make a difference and we must make a difference. Our work is not just important, it is urgent. The more time and energy we waste, the more animals will suffer. The smarter we work, the quicker we will find ways to help animals. Remind each other of this and model that urgency. Celebrate wins. Big and small milestones must be celebrated. No, countless hens roaming in a barn without sunlight, laying eggs without ever raising children is not good. But a switch to that from tiny cages means less pain, it means more expensive eggs, it means we are a step closer to liberation. It's like we pass a test on the way to graduation. It deserves a reward. And when you celebrate individual achievements, make it specific. Don't just say, uh, Aparna worked day and night to create a beautiful vegan video. Explain why that is an important step on the way to animal liberation. If instead you say, this video she worked on so hard will make it easier for her message to spread, for people to be inspired to eat better food. Thanks to Aparna's work, fewer animals will be killed for food. 
tie that celebration not to the input, the hard work, but to the impact someone makes. Make sure you feel good when you do good. Help others feel successful. Helping others feel successful will lead them to continue to want to do their critical work. Visualize the peaceful world we want to live in and how we are getting there together. Develop. Develop and grow other leaders. I'm not sure about you, um, though I think you do too. Um, I want to grow. I want to become a better person than I am today. I want to get better at protecting animals. I cannot do that alone. I need to learn from the people around me who have different perspective on the impact I make and who have different knowledge and experiences. A leader actively takes on the role of supporting people to become their best selves. Because not only does that mean you give someone the opportunity to be better, it means the organization will be better at achieving its goals. And you don't have to be a manager to do this. We each have some insights or abilities that others on our teams do not. If you share those, you develop others. Give feedback. Positive feedback, being explicit about how my action led to helping more animals is an incredible motivator. Giving constructive feedback, genuinely aimed at helping me be better that is specific and timely, makes me think you believe I have greater potential. That you trust me enough to have challenging conversations. For many, the best reward is attention. And I fully believe in positive reinforcement and leading by example. But ignoring unproductive behavior can mean robbing people of the opportunity to grow. Denying people a chance to improve, in my opinion, is short-sighted cowardice and selfish. Uh, individuals who believe their talents can be developed through hard work, good strategies, and input from others, they tend to achieve more than people with a more fixed mindset, those who believe their talents are innate gifts. And if we believe making mistakes is good, as Kirsty will show later today, then we need feedback. Share your knowledge. I need access to knowledge, so I don't waste time reinventing the wheel. When you share books, articles, strategies, and ideas with me, I feel like you have the expectation I can grow. I admit that in the past, I, I might not have always shared knowledge so that I could remain the sole expert, so that I could feel necessary. But the fear of becoming obsolete is one you must overcome. Leaders share knowledge, they don't hide it. They succeed when they help people become better than they are. Model good behavior. When I see someone successfully coach others, communicate bad news transparently and with compassion, or ask for comments and deal with critical feedback well, I have examples to copy from. Be aware of how your attitude and actions influence others' perceptions of what is acceptable and good. Monkey see, monkey do. Share space. Invite people to participate. It doesn't come natural to everyone to speak up or to step into new situations. But testing new things is important for my growth. When I am put in stretch opportunities and when I am invited to take up space, that becomes easier. If there are people on your team who you know are capable of more than they have shown or who might have good ideas but don't usually speak up, you can create openings for them to participate. Invite them in the conversation. You can help people get over their insecurity to get over that threshold of speaking up. Say, hey, Sarah, didn't you have a similar experience with X? What is your perspective? Or Ivan, I have only heard from the usuals, but what are the questions you have on this topic? Our success is highly independent on that of others. Connect. Connect to create a supportive collection, a collective, sorry. Your work can be emotionally taxing. The cruelty and suffering of animals seems endless. Our achievements are incremental. We need support to continue to do this work. Moreover, it is critical to provide the psychological safety where people can openly talk about the things that went wrong and might go wrong. 
If you weren't there on Friday, I recommend you watch Anya's talk, who spoke specifically about creating psychological safety. People won't share ideas if they do not feel they belong. Create a collective of allies. And here I'm actually going to disagree a tiny bit with Anya and Christina, who spoke on Friday. I don't think you need to be friends with the people you work with. We are less like a family and more like a sports team with a common goal. Friend groups can feel like cliques with outsiders. I think we need allies. People you can depend on to help you do your best work. Who you hold accountable and who hold you accountable. You have the most important connection with your colleagues. You all want to help animals. I don't want you to listen to me because we have the same cultural background, but because I have a good idea. And I need you to be critical of my suggestions and your opinion of them should not be colored by a mutual love for um, the music of Joy Division. We need to trust that when we disagree, we do so because we want to get to a point of better understanding how we can improve lives. We need relationships we can count on. To form a collective, a network of allies, build one-on-one -on -one relationships with people, but more importantly, support relationships between other people. Make introductions between people who could support each other or learn from each other. Check in. People do their best work when they feel a sense of belonging. To create that inclusion, for many that means they need people to check in with them, especially in times of crisis. If you are a queer advocate in Poland right now, your identity, your existence is basically threatened. Doing your work now is even harder than normal. Show each other compassion. Be kind and supportive. See how other people are doing and not just the ones you naturally gravitate towards. Remember that you have what you have in common and show up for each other. Speak up for each other in two ways. First, amplify voices, especially marginalized ones. If someone isn't listened to because they're not included or because they aren't as loud or as respected, you can repeat their points and attribute their ideas to them. This will make them feel heard and part of the team and better decisions can be made. Then speak up for each other, call them bad behavior. When someone uses disrespectful language or shows their bias, ask what they mean or explain why it can feel harmful. If you don't, you give your silent approval and encourage an environment of harassment. You can help create a brave space of belonging where only people's ideas are judged, not their identity. When I know you have my back, it will be easier for me to speak up for myself and for others. If people feel they are happy in their place of work, turnover is low and more people want to join your group. And you deliver better work as a collective than you do as a collection of individuals. So all these four things are connected. Each of the competencies support and reinforce each other without asking questions, without fully understanding why our methods are the best and how mundane tasks relate to the mission, it is hard to inspire each other about our ability to change the world. And without inspiration, without believing you can make a difference, what interest do I have to develop and grow? And if you do not develop, if you hoard your knowledge and don't invite people to participate, they will be less likely to feel like they have a part, that they are a part of a connected collective. And without people feeling like they are connected and valued, like they are judged on the validity of their ideas and not their character, they won't feel free to question the strategy that the organization is taking. There are four skills listed in the center circle, communication, Critical thinking, feedback, and DEI stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Learning about and practicing these core skills will help you get better at acting on the four leadership competencies around it. Each of these four skills deserve their own full task, if not full day multi sessions. So I can't go over all of them here. But 
I do want to go over diversity, equity, and inclusion briefly, because I think it's especially important for our movement now. We must care about humans. Research has shown we won't be as effective as organizations and as a movement without representation on our teams of the diversity of people, without people feeling like they belong, and without everyone being equally likely to achieve success. So diversity to me means um, people with different identities and ways of thinking are represented. In equity, people have what they need to thrive. In inclusion, people are heard and feel like they belong. I also believe that it is not just important for us to, um, to be more effective in our animal advocacy. I think it is our moral responsibility to create equity. If we are apathetic to injustice and don't stand up for people who might not be in the room, we consent to the status quo of oppression. There are many forms of exclusion plaguing our movement, sexism, ableism, heteronormativity, but I want to call out in particular anti-blackness and the need to incorporate anti-racism in our work. I recommend you seek out Encompass Movement to learn more about how to create racial justice in the animal advocacy space. I'll also want to show you how I think uh, DEI, these three concepts, are important for the four competencies I discussed. Questioning. Numerous studies have shown that diversity on your teams can create a work culture that is better at making more informed decisions. Because when you're all friends or like-minded people, it is very easy to get on the same smooth wavelength and produce ideas you each believe in. But it also means you're more likely to miss out on certain thoughts. On the other hand, when your team consists of people with very different life experience or different thinking patterns, deciding on strategy might feel a bit more like a struggle, but ideas are considered from more angles. Encouraging diversity, both cognitive and identity-based, will encourage more questions. Then inspire. We need to inspire everyone on our teams to deliver our best work. It will be very hard to motivate people that we can fight this massive battle together if some are excluded and feel like they do not belong. Develop. People of color and other marginalized persons are often less likely to succeed because they have less access to learning opportunities and mentorship, while at the same time, they are forced to live up to higher standards. Connecting. As a team member, you can help create a sense of inclusion, and without inclusion, people will not feel free to share their ideas, nor will people be open to listening to yours. Learn to recognize the way bias influences behavior and how it seeps into organizational systems so you can change them. Question yourself and listen to coworkers and people outside your community with an open mind. This will help you incorporate anti-oppression in your leadership. Without it, we are less effective. Without it, we won't have justice. We are all animals. In summary, you can make an impact on your coworkers or and your organization and your mission, irrespective of your authority. Question how people and plans in your organization lead to better lives for animals. Ask critical questions about the direction of your organization. Inspire the people you work with. Show them the difference your hard work together makes for animals. Develop others' ability to make impact and support them in their growth. And connect. Build relationships and make sure individuals feel like they belong. So. That is the majority of all I wanted to share with you today. So what's left is some questions I have for you, hoping that we can all learn from each other's experience. Uh, feel free to type um, in the chat box or to unmute yourself to share your thoughts. And I have three questions for you. And once we have gone through them, uh, there should be time for your Slido questions. So. Which one of my ideas will you try out?
and I'm going to remain uncomfortably quiet until someone speaks up or chats up. Uh, Bianca or Monica, if you're still here, uh, could you help me read the, if there's any chats? Okay, everyone. So uh, I just want to encourage you, uh, as Sin has said before, to answer um, her questions in the chat. Or if you have any questions, you can uh, ask through Slido. And Lukas says, voicing concerns or questions even more actively. Sophia says, or well, writes in the chat, repeating quiet people's ideas and attributing them uh, to that person. Natalie, uh, celebrate small victories for the animals more. Alina says to support other people's growth. Matthew says uh, he's gonna try celebrating small mil milestones and giving people feedback. So, um, let's see what time it is. Okay. Then next question, which one of my ideas will be challenging for you? Or maybe what are some ideas that you don't agree with that you think I should change my mind about? I don't see anyone that would write something right now in the group chat. So maybe it's not that challenging. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but maybe, for example, for me, a lot of the most challenging things are, for example, prevent the burnout and, well, doing most of these things and engage every day. Okay, and we have the first, given more from, from Natalie, giving more feedback is challenging, but very important. Then from Thomas, I think you can be too annoying. It can slow a process if everyone is critical of everything all the time. Then Mariana, exactly. Feedback is definitely the most challenging. Yeah, I have to agree with that. I think for me also, um both giving and receiving feedback um, is, is difficult and there is a lot to learn um, for that. And then uh, last question, something that in uh, the questionnaire or I think the survey that animal advocacy careers did, a lot of uh, CEOs and leaders said that communication is a super important management skill or a leadership skill. So that can mean a million things from like being good at speaking externally or uh, delivering nice presentations. But uh, what does it mean to you to communicate well as a leader? Okay, so again, we have some more comments from Tanya. Good communication uh, comes down to listening. And then from uh, Ishida, I, I didn't know if I pronounced the name right, but I hope so. Uh, not just hearing, but also understanding what someone has to say. Then from Mika, positioning yourself at the same level as others. Natalie have a really clear purpose, being able to explain why we are doing certain things. And from Lina, that there are no misunderstandings. I think those are all very great points. Yeah, I think so too. Those were all the questions I have for you.
And besides all the books I have read and the many more I still want to read, um, I think uh, Anya, again, sorry, I keep calling you out if you're here. Um, you also had some great book recommendations and I think many others do too. And these are some other sources that I have mentioned or that you can find online to read more about leadership practices. And especially don't forget your coworkers.